someone once said, the basic problem in life is that we live forward but understand backward. In other words, we make decisions that are going to have an impact on the future, but we don't know the future, and we many times don't know what that impact is going to be. All we know is what's happened in the past, and sometimes we don't even know that very well because our memory gets fogged, distorted. Psychologists have studied people to show how things that you Decisions you made in the past that didn't make you happy, you tend to make them over again. You forget. You thought it would make you happy the last time around and it didn't. Well, you try it again and again. And that was Einstein's definition of insanity, is doing the same thing but expecting different results. So it's a part of our lives that we're going to make mistakes, make decisions that we hope will lead to happiness, to good situations, and then they turn out leading to something else. So we have to learn how to deal with our mistakes. One is how to prevent as many as possible, and that's by being as observant as possible. This is one of the reasons why we meditate is to get rid of as much delusion as we can, try to be more mindful and more alert. Mindfulness is basically the ability to strengthen your memory. In this case, the memory that if you want to do something, you keep reminding yourself to do that. If you feel that it's going to be a good thing, that something's going to be in your interest, don't forget. Don't get distracted by other ideas or other intentions. Alertness is what enables you to pay close attention to what you're actually doing. So while we're focused on the breath, we're developing mindfulness, alertness, and a quality called ardency, which means that whatever you do, you try to do skillfully. In this case, try to relate to the breath in a skillful way. Try to notice in the past when the mind settled down with the breath, what worked, what didn't work, and then see if the same observations apply now. Sometimes they will. Sometimes. You begin to realize that what you observed the last time around either was a different situation or you didn't observe it carefully enough, so you've got to be more observant again. But the basic principle is as long as you're observant now, you can judge these things, what's working, what's not working. And as you get clearer and clearer about what you're doing in terms of your thoughts and your words and your deeds. It's a lot easier then to see the connections between the types of decisions that lead to happiness and the types that don't. And the Buddha gave instructions to his son. He said, first thing, before you do or say or think anything, ask yourself, what are the results going to be? And if it's the sort of thing you've done before, you can pretty much anticipate what the results will be. And if you realize that in the past that kind of action led to harm, you just don't do it. If you remember that it led to harm, but you go ahead and do it anyhow, that's the kind of mistake that you really regret, because it's going to lead to harm again, and here it goes again, all over again, the same old story. I mean, there are essentially two kinds of mistakes. Blameworthy mistakes are the ones that you, you knew better, but you went ahead and you did it anyhow. The other kinds of mistakes are the ones there's really no blame, because you didn't know. In cases where you don't know or you can't figure it out, well, go ahead and act on what you think is your best intention, what seems most likely to lead to happiness, least likely to lead to harm. Now, if you notice that as you're following through with that, it actually does lead to harm, you can stop. You're not committed to continuing with a mistake. If you don't see any harm coming from it, carry through with the action. When it's done, then you reflect back on what the actual results were. And if you saw that it led to any unintended harm, you make the resolve not to repeat that mistake and then talk it over with someone else who's also on the path. 
to see what insights they have to offer. If, however, you saw that there was no mistake at all and there was no harm at all, okay, take joy in the fact that you're on the path and you're training yourself well, and keep up with the training. So on the one hand, you try to prevent the repeat of past mistakes, but at the same time you realize there is the possibility that you're going to make further mistakes into the future, because there are lots of conditions, lots of situations that you really can't foresee. In which case you're trying to go on as much of your own skillful intentions as you can. This is another reason why we meditate, is try to strengthen the skillful intentions in the mind, the, the intentions that are not wound up in greed, that are not wound up in aversion or delusion. Greed and aversion are fairly easy to see. Delusion is hard, because after all, when you're deluded you don't really know the truth, which is why we have to learn from our past mistakes. So a large part of the practice is learning how to take mistakes in stride. The Buddha says you should feel shame over your mistakes, but it's not the kind of shame where you feel that you're a horrible person, but simply realize that you did something that was beneath you, that was not appropriate for you, and you don't want to repeat that mistake. So it's a healthy kind of shame. It's not debilitating. He teaches the same attitude in terms of issues of remorse. If you realize that you've made mistakes in the past, he doesn't have you dwell on them more than just recognizing that they were mistakes. And then you remind yourself that no matter how guilty you may feel about it, the mistake you made, that guilt is not going to go back and erase the mistake. The best you can do is to resolve not to repeat it. And then you try to strengthen skillful qualities in the mind. And he, and he highly recommends the, the attitudes we were chanting just now. Unlimited goodwill, unlimited compassion, unlimited empathetic joy or appreciation, and unlimited equanimity. In other words, put yourself in a position where you can feel these emotions for anybody. Basically, you start out with goodwill. Reminding yourself there's no need to see anybody in the world suffer. Because if people are suffering, that's why they tend to do evil things. They feel threatened, they feel attacked, they feel like they're in a weak position, and so they strike out. So no matter how much you may dislike a particular person, there's really no re reason to wish ill on them. What you do is wish, could this person find true happiness? If they could find true happiness within, the disagreeable behavior that they're engaging in would fall away. At the same time, if you can develop goodwill for everybody, it's a lot harder to harm people, harm yourself or harm anyone else. This strengthens your resolve not to repeat your mistake. The same with compassion. That's to be directed to people you see are suffering. You don't want to pile more suffering on top of them. If you find yourself in a position where you can help, okay, you go ahead, you're happy to help. And even if you're not, you extend that wish. May they be relieved from their suffering so that maybe someday you find you would do find yourself in a position where you can help and you can carry through. As for empathetic joy, that's when you see people are happy. And you remind yourself not to be jealous of their happiness. You don't resent their happiness. Try to put yourself in their place. As the Buddha once said, that if you see somebody really misering it, miserable and suffering, remind yourself, you've been there. You see a leper on the side of the road, he would say, sticking a burning stick into his wounds because they, they hurt so much, trying to numb the sensation of the itch. He says, you've been there. When someone's really wealthy, look at them and you realize, you've been there too. It should give you a sense of Sort of dismay over the ups and downs of this wandering on. But what it also means is that when you see somebody suffering, remind yourself that you're not in a, a better person than they are necessarily, and you're not immune to that suffering in the future. So you do what you can to help. And when someone's happy, remind yourself, okay, you've been there too. You realize that 
whatever the happiness may be, it tends to pass. And it's not a relative measure of how much good karma you have in the past as opposed to theirs. If they're happier than you or wealthier than you or whatever. There's no such thing as a single karma account with a running balance. We have lots of different actions in the past, and different actions have seeds that will sprout at different times. Sometimes some of them take a long time, some of them take a short time. So there's no need to be jealous of anyone else's happiness. Finally, equanimity is when there are situations where you really can't help. Someone's really suffering, and there's really nothing you can do for them. You develop equanimity. And it's not a hard-hearted equanimity, it's just you realize you can't let your happiness rise and fall with theirs. Because you've got other things you need to do, other areas where you can be of help. You want to focus on those. Now, the trick here is learning how to develop these emotions when you need them. All too often our attitude towards our emotions is that they're a given. And here the Buddha is saying you can actually change your emotions. And this is an important skill, that you can feel goodwill for anyone at any time when it's called for. You can feel compassion, empathetic joy anytime for anyone when it's called for. You can develop equanimity, even in cases where people are close to you. You want very much to help them, but you can't. You've got to develop equanimity. And this requires skill. This is another thing we learn through the meditation. As the Buddha once said, our emotions are a fabrication. They're things that are created in the mind. They're not necessarily a given. What are they made out of? Well, physically, they're affected by the breath. Inside the mind, they're affected by the kind of conversations the mind has with itself, and also by feelings of pleasure and pain, neither pleasure nor pain, and the perceptions, the labels we put on things. And as we meditate, we're trying to learn how to be more conscious of these factors so that we can turn them in the right direction. If you breathe with more knowledge and alertness, it helps to develop more skillful emotions. Because what is an emotion? It's a thought that gets into your body and has an impact on your heart rate and other physical processes. Well, the impact comes through the breath. So if you learn how to get in touch with your breath and can smooth out the breath, soothe out the breath when it gets erratic or disturbed, then you have a grounding for developing skillful emotions, embodying skillful emotions. So they're not just thoughts. And then your perceptions, you learn to look at the world in a way that makes it easier to develop these attitudes. This also is a process that you learn how to master through the meditation, as you perceive the breath, say, in the different parts of the body. Perceive how it can be spread around. Perceive how the breath can be a whole body process. Various ways of visualizing the breath, visualizing the way you relate to breath, the breath. If you learn how to change these things consciously, it gets easier to change other perceptions consciously as well. So you can actually turn your emotions in a proper direction. And this has an impact on that issue of mistakes in several ways. One, if you can get more skillful in how you relate to other people, how you relate to yourself, you're less likely to make mistakes. You're less likely to make the mistakes, particularly the kinds of mistakes that do harm. And that's from mistakes that you can't help simply because you couldn't see what was going to happen in the future. There's a passage where the Buddha said that those kind of mistakes, if you learn how to develop these unlimited attitudes, they don't carry that much karmic impact. Because your basic attitude doesn't have limits. There's no limit on your goodwill, no limit on your compassion. No limit on your 
empathetic joy or equanimity. When your mind is broadened in that way, then the impact of past events just doesn't hit it that hard. Even more so as you develop more concentration and discernment and begin to separate the mind from its objects. In other words, when pain arises, you're aware of the pain, but you don't have to identify with the pain. That perception that says that the pain is mine, you can cut right through it. And you find that makes a huge difference. Or even just the perception of pain, you learn how to question that. You learn how to see when that particular perception, say, that comes when there's pain in your leg, say. How do you visualize that pain? How do you relate to the pain? Where are you in relationship to the pain? You start asking these questions, you begin to realize how strange some of your perceptions are. Many times you'll come up with unexpected answers, that you really do have a visualization of the pain, or you tend to portray the pain in your mind as something that does seem to have a will of its own. When you stop and think about it, well, it doesn't have a will, it's just there. It's a mal malfunction of the body. And it doesn't have a shape, and the pain moves around quite a lot, quite a lot more. It changes quite a lot more quickly than we tend to assume. So you begin to see how your assumptions ch shape your experience of things. And so you're going to change your assumptions, change your perceptions, so you don't have to suffer so much. This means you have the skill to deal with whatever comes. And when you have that kind of skill, then you can live with a lot more confidence, knowing that even if you do make unintended mistakes, you have the skill to deal with the results. In other words, the more mindfulness, the more alertness, the more concentration and discernment you can develop now, you're less likely to make mistakes. And even if you do, you can live with them more easily without being harmed by them. Buddhism is, is unusual among the world's religions, and it was founded by someone who had made mistakes, or admits that it was founded by someone who, made, who knew that he had made mistakes. The Buddha was a human being just like us, and through the many years of his many lives, he knew he'd made lots of mistakes, but he learned how to learn from those mistakes, and that's what made all the difference. So he knew what it's like to have made a mistake, to regret making mistakes, to be in this position of living forward but only understanding backwards. And so from his experience of learning how to overcome those difficulties, he gives us some wise advice on, that's on trying to prevent as many mistakes as we can, but also learning how to live with mistakes because that's what life is full of. We always make mistakes. We often make mistakes. And if we take them as an opportunity to learn, rather than a, a reason either to go into strong guilt or strong denial, if we take them as an opportunity to learn, we can benefit from them. As we come to learn, to understand more and more what's going on right now. The more clearly you see right now, then the less likely the choices you make are going to ha cause harm on in the future. So instead of looking forward or looking back, we look back some, but we want to look now as much as possible, because everything comes together right here. So as you go through life, try to bring as much attention as possible to the quality of mind that underlies your decisions right here, right now. Make it as skillful as possible, both in remembering past mistakes, remembering past right decisions. And learning how to live skillfully with the results of both.